Hey everybody, this is Russ from Retro Game Core. So this thing just arrived in the mail yesterday, and I've been playing around with it for about 24 hours now, and so I think it's about time to give you a quick impressions video just to show you what I think about this device, especially in the context of similar devices at a similar price point. Now this is the Odroid Go Super. It is an upgraded version of the Odroid Go Advance, which is the device that many current handheld systems like the RG351P are based on. And it has a lot of features that are similar to the RG351P and other devices that are like it, but there are definitely some features that I want to talk about as well. So just for context, this thing costs about $100 after it's been shipped to you, so same price as some of the other devices. It runs the exact same chipset, same RAM, same GPU as any of these other devices like the RG351P, but the battery is a little bit bigger. It's about 500 milliamp hours bigger than the RG351P. It says it's going to get 10 hours of gameplay. I'll believe it when I see it. Now the big thing is that it has a 5 inch display with an 854 by 480 resolution, which results in about a 16 by 9 aspect ratio. Not perfectly, but that's about where it is. So it has a much bigger screen, but I'm not really sure that it's worth it. We'll talk about that in a minute. First, let's unbox. Now I received my device from a company called Ameridroid, and they're basically an Odroid distributor, but you can also buy it from the company that makes Odroid, which is called Hard Kernel, and they will ship to you from Korea. It took about five days to get to me from the day they shipped it to its arrival from California, and I thought that was pretty fast. Inside you'll see they give you a little bit of candy, and then no frills or anything, just the device itself. Now if you know anything about the original Odroid Go Advance, it actually came in a kit that you had to assemble yourself. The Odroid Go Super is different, it's actually been pre-assembled for you, which is a pretty convenient feature. Although to be honest, I probably would have looked forward to putting it together myself, I just really enjoy doing those kinds of things. Inside the box you see that there's a USB-C cable, and it's a pretty decent cable. I wish it was a little bit longer, but it feels nice and sturdy. And here we are. Well, first impressions of looking at this device, uh, the screen is very impressive. It is very large. My second impression was the fact that it uses those terrible analog sticks that you find on the RGB10. And you may have noticed from my earlier footage that I actually have already swapped this out with a PS Vita analog stick and it's much better. The face buttons feel pretty good. They're a little bit more mushy than clicky, but they feel solid to me. And I can't say enough bad things about this analog stick, but luckily I knew it was coming and so I went and I bought PS Vita analog sticks so that I could swap about from day one. And on the bottom here you can see they have these additional function buttons. There's four of them all together, two on each side, and these have a weird mushy feel to them. They feel a lot like start and select buttons from the old NES controllers. The D-pad feels pretty decent, but honestly it is also a little bit small and thin. Considering how big this device is, I wish that the D-pad was just a little bit bigger too. It just feels dwarfed by the size of the device. Overall it feels fairly balanced in the hand. I think that the weight is distributed nicely. And you can see on the bottom there is an SD card slot, but there is no SD card that comes with this device at all. So not only will you have to buy your own SD card, you'll have to flash your own firmware as well. I like the fact that it has smooth shoulder buttons and they're kind of chunky and they're not very clicky either. So I think they actually feel better to me than the RG351P. You have a power button on top, some holes for ventilation, volume up and down, a headphone jack, USB-C port for charging, and then a USB-A OTG port. I really like that it's USB-A because it makes it very convenient to be able to put a Wi-Fi dongle right in it. And on the back you can see there's holes for a single speaker and then also ventilation as well. So let's get a look at this screen. So it has a very large and impressive screen, especially when you're looking at screen to controller ratio here but a lot of that comes from these huge bezels on each side and top and bottom. And I found it very distracting when I was playing the game. In terms of overall size, you can see here that the screen itself is almost the size of the RG351P. They have almost the exact same thickness between the two devices, but obviously the Odroid Go Super is just much larger. I've been told it's about the size of a Nintendo Switch Lite. We don't have a Nintendo Switch Lite at the house, so I'm not able to compare that myself. But I do have a different 5-inch screen that I can compare it with, and that's the PS Vita. And the thing that really strikes me about these two devices is just how much more extra bulk is involved with the Odroid Go Super versus the PS Vita. When you hold the PS Vita, it feels very compact and easy to hold. This Odroid Go Super is like holding a sheet of paper. It's just a very big device. And when I push down on the buttons and kind of get an overall feel for it, it just feels kind of like hollow. It's hard to describe, but when you tap on it, you can definitely tell that it just feels like a hollow device as opposed to something that's very solid. And maybe that's because of the vent on the back, I'm not really sure. 
but in comparison to a AAA device like the PS Vita, this one does feel a little more hollow and just amateurish comparatively. It's just not quite as solid feeling. So just to verify, turning it on here, you can see there's no micro SD card and it won't boot at all. But luckily there are several different operating systems that are available for this device, and I'm going to start with the one called Retro Arena. And Retro Arena has been around for a while, it's actually what ArcOS was forked from originally. So I figured that would be my best bet because it's similar to a firmware that I'm intimately familiar with. And it seems like of all the Odrego Super firmwares that are available right now, this one is the most advanced of all of them. And it runs a version of Ubuntu 20. Okay, so let's just check out the menus very briefly here. I haven't done anything other than flashing this image onto the SD card, so there's no games or anything else on here yet. Now you may not pick up on it here in this video, but this screen is super sharp. It looks very, very nice. Just navigating through these menus feels very good. All the text is nice and crisp and clear. It's very impressive. Comparing it to an RG351M screen right here, this one just feels a lot more low resolution than the one on the Odroid Goat Super. So already there's a very clear advantage just from looking at the menu here with this Odroid Goat Super. It looks very impressive. Okay, so now I'm gonna load it up with some games. Now, unfortunately, Retro Arena does not have the ability to plug an SD card in and just drag and drop games, so you're going to have to use Wi-Fi FTP. And it's going to take a while to transfer your games over, just be ready for that. And unfortunately, all of these firmwares for this device at this time work the exact same way, so there's no ability to use an SD card to transfer ROMs over. So I figured because the RG351 devices do so well with Game Boy Advance games, that was going to be the first system I tested with. So just to give you a baseline, here's the RG351P running Alien Hominid here on the Game Boy Advance. And it looks nice and clear, it's a two-time integer scaling. So when I pulled it up here in Retro Arena, it did not look the same to me, it looked a lot fuzzier. So I figured it might be an issue with RetroArch, so I went into the video settings, and then sure enough, bilinear filtering was on. So I turned that off, and then I started up the game again. And so here we are, it looks nice and sharp now. So I'm not sure why that was turned on, but just make sure you turn off bilinear filtering when you're playing Game Boy Advance using Retro Arena. I think in terms of sharpness and clarity, they seem about equal to me on both devices. But because the Game Boy Advance is a 3 by 2 aspect ratio and the Odroid Go Super is a 16 by 9 you are still going to have black bars on the sides for Game Boy Advance. It's not a perfect scaling like it is on the RG351P. And there really is something to be said about the fact that there are no black bars when you're playing Game Boy Advance on this device. It just feels so solid and compact. It's like the perfect Game Boy Advance machine. Now with the Odro Go Advance, yes, you're going to have a larger Game Boy Advance screen, but you're dealing with a much larger device here. It just doesn't have that perfect compact feel that the RG351P has. So speaking of larger device, let's check out the weights on all these. So 9.84 ounces for the Odro Go Super, so nearly 10 ounces. Now the RG351P is 6.74 ounces, so it's about two thirds the weight. That 9.84 or 9.88 size of the Odroico Super is very significant. It's actually heavier than the RG351M, which is made out of aluminum. Although admittedly, even though the RG351M is lighter than the Odroico Super, the Odroico Super feels much more balanced in the hand. It's not so compact in its weight. And I think it's a good thing. I like that the device is evenly distributed like that in my hands. Okay, trying out Game Boy Color here. Now this is using an integer scaling right here. So there are a little bit of black bars on the top and bottom, but you can see the black bars on the sides are just massive. And when you account for the bezels and everything, it's just kind of comical how small the screen is compared to how much of a device you have here. I mean, you talk about wasted space. This is just kind of incredible. And you could definitely stretch the image, you know, to make it fill up more space, but I don't think you're going to want to have a very stretched game like that. In general, when you're playing a system that has a basically square aspect ratio like this, it's not going to look very good on a device like this. Now one device that does take advantage of this big screen is the Nintendo DS, because in this screen you can actually just play them side by side. And honestly, it doesn't look too bad. I wish it was scaled more perfectly so you wouldn't have black bars on the top and bottom, but it still looks pretty good. And if you're ever playing a Nintendo DS game where you do need to see both screens, this is going to be a good solution for you. And personally, I found that navigating through menus using both screens like this made things very easy. But when it came to actually playing the games themselves, I found that I did not like having both screens available to me. Because again, it felt a lot like wasted space. So playing a game like Mario Kart DS, I didn't like it in split screen. I actually went back to just having the full screen. 
And thankfully, because there's so many function buttons available on this device, it's very easy to set hotkeys for it. So for example, I set up a hotkey in this emulator so that I can toggle between having widescreen, two screens, and then this single screen here. Okay, moving on to NES, you can see the same problem here where there's a lot of wasted screen real estate, but I will say that when you actually are playing the game and you have it near your eyes, it looks beautiful. All of those scaling issues that I'm used to with the RG351 and other RK3326 devices are just not present on this device. The higher resolution screen compensates for all the pixel distortion that you had earlier. So I can comfortably play games with integer scaling on the NES and they look great. And I really like the screen on this device, the colors are very vibrant and I think the color balance is just about perfect. So in general I'm very happy with the quality of the screen itself, minus those big bezels. And I have the same experience with 16-bit systems. You can see here with Super Nintendo, the text is nice and clear. All of those pixel distortions that bother me about the other devices are just not present on this device. So if you're the kind of person who doesn't mind having black bars on the sides, and you want to have a very nice crystal clear picture, this is going to be a very good device for that. I mentioned it earlier in this video, but I am not a fan of this D-pad. Look at how thin it is. I just think it's a wasted opportunity to have a bigger D-pad on this device. Now one of the things that impressed me about Retro Arena is how well it emulates a Nintendo 64. So playing Super Mario 64 on this device, for example, was perfect. I had no slowdown when I was playing the game. And after installing those PS Vita analog sticks, it became a much more pleasurable experience. And I filmed that entire hardware modification, so I'll do a video here soon where I show you how to swap out the PS Vita analog sticks. So because Nintendo 64 emulation was so good, I wanted to test out a bunch of games. You can see me here with Super Smash Bros. I'm not very familiar with this game, but to me it felt smooth. I didn't feel any sort of lag. When I'm testing Nintendo 64, I usually use Mario Tennis as an example because it's very hard to emulate. And you can see here it didn't do perfectly with that. There are definitely some times where it has a lot of slowdown. But other games like F-Zero did really well. I think that playing Nintendo 64 games on this device is going to be one of my favorite things to do. And maybe finally one day I'll actually get pretty good at playing F-Zero because I'm terrible at it. Now in terms of aspect ratio, I think this screen is perfect for PSP. This version of Retro Arena does not have the FPS patch that is taken from Batacera, and so the emulation I found on this was a little bit worse than what you can get on the RG351P when using custom firmware like ArcOS or 351 Elec. I think for lower end games like Ridge Racer it plays just fine, and it's very impressive with this big screen. But once you move over to something like God of War, not only is the gameplay very slow, but it has some visual artifacts as well. And unfortunately, because you can only transfer games via Wi-Fi FTP, and I only have a 2.4 GHz Wi-Fi adapter, just transferring these two PSP games over took almost an hour. So later I hope to be able to show you other PSP games, but right now I just didn't have time to transfer everything over. I've also ordered a 5 GHz Wi-Fi adapter because they work on this device, which is pretty cool. Let me give you a couple other shots of the hardware now that I have the PS Vita analog sticks installed. And they look great. You can see how well they blend in with the rest of the device. These were about $10 each, and I think that $20 was definitely worth it. Overall, I don't really mind the hardware aspect of this device. Like I mentioned before, I do think it is a little bit hollow feeling. But overall, I think everything is placed really well. Now one thing I want to mention about the plastic on the device itself is that it has a very matte feel to it. It's almost like it's been sanded down. And I think because of that, it picks up a lot of natural grease from your hands. So you can see there's a bunch of smudges on the back of it over the course of just playing this for a few hours. I do like the partially gritty feel of having a matte plastic like this. So I'm hoping these natural oils from my hand don't make this experience any worse. All right, everyone, that's it for this video. This is really just a quick unboxing and impressions video. I will do a full review in the future, but I definitely need more time with this device so that I can figure out what I like and what I don't like about it. Overall, I would say this device reminds me a lot of the RG351P when it first came out, in that I'm gonna need some time to kind of get a feel for it and figure out the ins and outs and maybe make some extra guides to help you unlock the potential of this device. Overall, I'm impressed with this device. I like the, having this large screen. This is the largest screen I've had on a device like this other than my PS Vita. I do like the fact that I'm already fairly familiar with the device itself just because I've used similar devices in the past, which makes this a very comfortable device right from the get-go. Now I'm nowhere near the point of being able to say that this device is better than others, but I think its sub $100 price point does make it a compelling offer. 
especially given the fact that it has a significantly larger and higher resolution screen than all those other devices. And given the screen's aspect ratio, I think this is going to be an ideal device for playing with game streaming. I think that playing modern games on this through Google Stadia or through Moonlight are going to be really fun. So that's one of the things I'm looking forward to most. So what are you looking forward to most about this device? Let me know in the comments below. I'd love to hear what kind of things you want to see in the future. As always, thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe if you found this helpful for you, and we will see you next time. Happy gaming.